All right. Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's time once again. Let's talk metal. For this video, I'm doing a response to a video recently posted on the Killing for Company channel. That is, of course, run by Kellen. Most of you will be very familiar with his work. Kellen does the Heavy Metallurgy Album Club videos and streams on Wednesday nights with Marty and Jim. Always fun content they have over there. And Kellen has lots of great original content on his channel as well. Recently, he posted a response to a video I did. So I guess this is a response to a response. So we're, we're starting a kind of protracted conversation here, I guess. It, Kellen did mention in his video he thought about just posting a comment in my video, but it turned out to be really long, so he just turned it into his own video. And then the same thing happened to me. I'm like, well, I'll just type a quick reply to his. And by the time I got to the second page, I'm like, eh, screw this. Let's just... Make our own video and uh, keep the conversation going this way. Uh, the first thing I want to say here is, Kellen, I'm very, very disappointed in your blatantly transparent attempt to placate me by playing Atlantean Codex in the background during your entire video. Am I really that cheap? I, I mean, come on. What? You think you're some kind of a Jedi waving your Atlantean Codex CDs around? Atlantean Codex CDs don't work on me. I'm a Tadarian. Only new wave of British heavy metal. You come back when you got some cloven hoof or Tokyo Blade to play, son. I swear, kids these days. Anyway, joking aside, Kellen's video is very, very good. Um, but to start at the beginning of the chain, a while back I made a new wave of traditional heavy metal video. I just wanted to talk about the genre in particular, mention, you know, some bands that I think are particularly good from it, and kind of, you know, help wrap my head and introduce some other folks to it as well. Some folks had brought up the point they weren't very familiar with the term, didn't quite know what it meant or what it encompassed, and so I was trying to get some thoughts and musings recorded about that. And to be clear, I'm very positive about the new wave of traditional heavy and metal movement overall. I think it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of bands I like. That is not the case for everybody. There are some metalheads and even some old school metalheads such as myself that are very dismissive of new wave of tradi traditional heavy metal. That's their opinion. They have their reasons, and I do understand some of their points. But just to be clear, that's not where I'm coming from. I do think it's a pretty interesting movement and does have some really quality releases coming out. Uh, and, you know, Kellen definitely appreciated my video, which was very kind of him. You know, there were just some particular things that he wanted to follow up on or some things, you know, that he did, you know, uh, take issue with uh, and had kind of a different view on. And that's perfectly fine. That's, you know, why we make these videos. No one's going to agree on every single point. You know, Kellen's content is always very well thought out. Those of you who have seen his videos know this. And so I thought it was worthwhile following up on a few of his points because he does have some very, very good ones. Um, Before I dive into some particular points from his video. Something that's going to come up as I talk is a bit of a discussion about genres and subgenres. And I know this is a topic that for a lot of heavy metal fans is very eye-rolling, that we get a little bit tired of having metal split and then re-split and then re-re-split into all these very tiny, narrow subgenres. It can be and kind of groan inducing to try to keep track of all these different little terms and niches and such. I very much get that, and I do agree on that a lot of the time. On the other hand, however, it's worth remembering that genres and subgenres, they're a classification system, and they are meant to help facilitate communication. That's what classification is all about. Think of it this way if someone, you know, comes up to you and asks, hey, what does this album sound like? Or what does this band sound like? And you tell them, it's a heavy metal album. Does that really give them much information? You know, in 1971, that would have been perfectly fine. Somebody came up and said, you know, hey, Deep Purple and Rock, what is this? It's a heavy metal album. People would have recognized very quickly what that album was going to sound like. Here, you know, in you know, the 21st century, that term is very broad, telling somebody that, oh, that's a heavy metal album. Well, that could sound like Black Sabbath or Judas Priest or Cannibal Corpse or Between the Buried and Me or Ginger. 
the person's not really going to understand what the album or band sounds like. They are going to need something more descriptive than just the term heavy metal. And that's why you know, sometimes subgenres and sub subgenres are important. You know, the idea is to be able to use words to convey what bands are going to sound like so that somebody can make an informed decision. Do I want to spend my time and or my money listening and purchasing you know, this particular thing? It's not a perfect system. Of course, you know, bands can blend and mix lots of different styles together, so it can be hard to describe uh, sound just using you know, vocabulary words. It's not always an easy thing to do, and I get that. But they do serve a purpose. As much of a headache as they can be, having metal split into these different subgenres does help a lot. If somebody is specifically looking for things that you know fit into, you know, epic power metal or things that you know, sound very much like a band like Zaster in black metal circles. They don't want to hear all black metal. They're looking for particular things, and the terminology helps get those points across. Right? Just wanted to add that disclaimer before I dive in because you know, some subgenres do come up here along the way. All right, again, Let's get started with talking about some of Kellen's points. You know, uh, he has a lot of good background points about you know bands such as Accept being a big part of that early '80s metal movement that has a big influence on new wave of traditional heavy metal later on. He did a really good job listing different labels that are important to the scene. He mentioned I Hate Records, which I hadn't thought of in quite a while. I always liked that label. I thought they had a lot of good releases on them. Uh, the first, I guess, point. For some contention that comes up is around Hammerfall and their Glory to the Brave album. So I had said in my video that you know, Glory to the Brave was a big sort of moment for a new wave of traditional heavy metal. And I guess that left Kellen scratching his head a little bit because he doesn't really see Hammerfall in that light. And you know, there's going to be a different perspective here because there's a little bit of a difference in age and how long we've listened to different styles. But something to clarify here, I do agree with Kellen that Hammerfall is not a new wave of traditional heavy metal band. I would never lump them into that particular category. You know, Hammerfall to me is very much you know, a European power metal band, and I think they fit pretty comfortably in that genre. I don't think a lot of folks would argue against that. The point with Glory to the Brave is not that they you know, founded the new wave of traditional heavy metal. It's that they made it possible for bands who wanted to play that style of music to get a lot more visibility, especially in the United States. I, I cannot stress strongly enough how little interest there was in traditional metal and power metal in the United States during, say, you know, the mid-1990s. Uh, I talked to King Fowley years ago. He, of course, you know, was most known for Deceased, but he also had a band called you know, October 31st that played a more traditional style of heavy metal. And he shopped that band around to labels in the mid-90s. And he was told flat out, there is no market for this. We can't sign this band because nobody wants to hear this style of heavy metal anymore. I mean, they, brutal honesty, but you know, that was the message you know, he was given. And so you can only imagine... For other bands like October 31st, who didn't have a highly visible figurehead like King Fowley trying to champion their cause, they were getting zero interest from labels. If they got a label, it was probably a European label or a Japanese label. They were getting some exposure in other countries, maybe, but not in the US. You know, at the same time, a lot of the bands that were doing very well in Europe and Japan had no distribution stateside. You know, Blind Guardian was at their peak. Running Wild was releasing killer albums. It, lots of you know those German bands, Italian bands like Stradivarius were becoming very popular overseas. None of that stuff had distribution in the U.S. If you wanted those albums, you had to order them as expensive imports through independent record stores. That was it. That all changed when Glory to the Brave broke big for Nuclear Blast. Came out in '97. And it really did have a seismic reaction. Uh, it may seem strange to think of now. I know Hammerfall has become a band that's very easy to hate on for a lot of people. I myself lost interest in them a long time ago. I haven't kept up with them in ages. 
but that album really broke down the doors and revitalized interest in classic 80s heavy metal in America. And they did it not just by putting out an extremely good album that managed to get onto a big label and have good distribution. They also did it by covering songs by a lot of those old forgotten bands. They covered Warlord. They covered Stormwitch. They covered Pretty Maids. And all of a sudden, you had all these people who had been listening to nothing but death metal and black metal for the entirety of the 90s all of a sudden wanting to know, where can I find a Stormwitch album? Well, who's Pretty Maids? Oh, Warlord. What's Warlord? Where'd that come from? It was a very eye-opening album, and it paved the way for bands to get attention from distributors and from labels. And so, yes, uh, Kellen and I, I think, agree that Hammerfall is not a new wave of traditional heavy metal band. My point in my original video, and maybe I didn't make it very clearly at the time, I think they just, again, they opened the door so that this new glut of bands could get themselves established and up and running and have interest in what they were doing. Obviously, a band can play whatever they want to any time they want to. But in terms of having some access to commercial markets, that's a different story. It's one thing to play around in your garage or your bedroom. It's another thing to find a label willing to press up physical product for you and promote you. And Glory to the Brave really opened up those doors for the bands that would then start to form what we now think of as new wave of traditional heavy metal. All right, so hopefully that clarifies the uh, hammer fall issues. Now, the next thing that's a little different in Kellen's video, he focuses a lot on bands from around 2008. And that's plus or minus a few years. He just used 2008 as a benchmark here, and that's perfectly fine. And this is something that's important to note because here is a difference in perspective in that I'm not very familiar with a lot of the stuff that came out in that time frame. Right there in kind of the 2008, 2010 time frame, I was you know, wrapping up my doctorate degree, was working full time, uh, had relocated. And so, yeah, I was focused on a lot of very different things and I didn't pay a lot of attention to new heavy metal releases. I was hearing some stuff here and there, but I wasn't nearly as deeply invested in the current releases as I had been, you know, five years earlier. What I was paying attention to in terms of music listening was older stuff. Around 2008 in that time frame, I was digging back into a lot of the more obscure stuff from the 1980s and the 1990s. So again, the new releases coming out didn't always get a whole lot of my attention. That's you know a failing on my part, I suppose. On the other hand, nobody can listen to everything all the time. If you're paying a lot of attention to old releases, you're probably not going to hear some of the new releases as much. You know, some of the bands that Kellen mentioned, uh, for example, were groups like you know In Solitude, Portrait. You know, that all you know were starting to come to bear around the 2008 timeframe. And some of those bands I did hear a little bit of at the time, but to be frank, they didn't impress me very much. Uh, it was very much like this band. Eh, it sounds like a weaker version of Merciful Fate. Why do I want to hear that? I'll just go listen to Merciful Fate. So yeah, those bands didn't really resonate with me much in you know, the late 2000s. And so I kind of bypassed them. Now, those albums are widely cited by lots of folks as important to new wave of traditional heavy metal. And correctly so. So yeah, Kellen's right that those albums should be mentioned as part of the discussion. I left them out because it's uh, kind of a little bit of a blind spot in my listening history. It's just not stuff I was listening to as it was coming out. I I've heard a little bit of newer stuff from them here and there, but I've never really connected you know, with the bands that started right around that time frame. The same is true for some of the power metal bands and death metal bands and other things. Just new releases were not where my head was at around 2008. So yeah, I think Kellen's video does a really good service in noting that time frame is where you do see bands that came to be known as new wave of traditional heavy metal were getting their footing. 
Hammer falls too early. Hammer falls outside the movement. They just kind of paved the way for those bands by 2008 to definitely be making their mark. So good on Kellen for including those. Bad on me for not including those. But I did leave them out for a reason. I'm not very familiar with them. All right. That then leads to a discussion of one particular band in particular, and this is one I think that, uh, you know, Kellen had a lot of pause with in my video, was what to do with Crypt Sermon. You know, I mentioned Crypt Sermon as a band that they're a fantastic band, really enjoy their music, but I don't really consider them part of the new wave of traditional heavy metal. And apparently this really made Kellen scratch his head and be like, wait, what? Uh, and was kind of, you know, the impetus for him starting to put together a response video to what I had said. Uh, so here's the deal with Crypt Sermon. Um, Crypt Sermon has, you know, a very obvious doomy influence in their sound. It's not the only thing they've got. You know, they blend in a lot of traditional heavy metal uh, song styles as well. And, you know, that's been done before. Early Solitude Eternus, for example, was good at that. In my experience, and I've only heard so much of the new wave of traditional heavy metal, there are now, you know, probably hundreds of bands and thousands of albums. Nobody's heard it all. Among the stuff that I've heard, especially in recent years, where this movement has really blown up and proliferated a lot, I don't come across a lot of bands that have a strong doom influence. They're much more in the straightforward, accept, maiden, priest, merciful fate, maybe kind of veins. Not so much, you know, the candle masses or troubles or, you know, bands like that. And that's why I tend to put Crip Sermon on the, you know, at best the outskirts of New Wave of Traditional Heavy Metal. And, but, you know, more to the point, I kind of put them, you know, as an outlier. They're a little bit you know, beyond where I would set up the boundaries for that term. And again, it, genres are tricky. They definitely have a component of their sound that could be considered similar to other new wave of traditional heavy metal bands. But you know, from my perspective, the Doomy influence is something that I kind of put outside of new wave of traditional heavy metal. Maybe I'm correct in doing so. Maybe I'm not. And maybe it's not a yes or no question. Maybe it's just a matter of opinion. You know, this, you know, kind of ruffled Kellen's feathers a bit because some of those bands around the 2008 timeframe that he was referencing, groups like Blood Ceremony, apparently have a pretty doomy sound. I've never heard of Blood Ceremony. I don't know a thing about them, much less what they sound like. You know, some of the you know, portrait and in solitude, I guess, lean a little bit more that way. Um and so from that perspective, if you're thinking of those bands as your foundation for new wave of traditional heavy metal, then something like Crip Sermon would fit in very naturally because you're used to thinking of that sort of doomy element being part of the sound. You know, in my experience, the albums I know, I don't come across that as much. Now, right now, some of you are probably you know screaming at the screen, but Alan, what about Atlantean Codex? You know, it's a band I champion quite a bit. I think they're one of the, one of, not one of, I think they're the best band to come out of heavy metal period in the past uh, two decades. They are the band of the 21st century for me. I don't really consider them to wave of traditional heavy metal. You know, they've got, and there you get more complicated. They've got, you know, a very epic vibe to their music that owes a lot to Bathory and Manowar. They've got a lot of doomy tendencies, uh, but yes, they do have a very you know, classic metal you know, framework that all these other things are you know, built on top of. But yeah, I've never really lumped Atlantean Codex in with the bands like you know, Portrait and In Solitude. Interestingly, Atlantean Codex did show up around that same time frame. I think the first EP came out maybe around 2000, uh, somewhere between 2005, 2008. So it's in that time frame, but for whatever reason, that one caught my attention and clicked with me instantly. Whereas, you know, the others around that time frame were just kind of like, eh, not really that interested or never got into them. So yeah, even Atlantean Codex, I think, you know, their sound is a little bit different than the bulk of the new wave of traditional heavy metal bands that I personally have checked out and been exposed to. So I don't know if I really put them in those circles either. 
And so that kind of begs, you know, the question, you know, what do you do with the doomy side of new wave of traditional heavy metal? And, you know, was doom really a part of, you know, the classic 80s metal sound? Kellen kind of makes the case that, you know, doomy bands were a part of that classic 80s movement. Uh, he mentions in particular some things like Trouble and St. Vitus. And you know, my knee-jerk reaction, at least, is I think those bands still had a very distinct sound from the Metal Blade bands that Kellen and I would agree kind of make up the bulk of what we mean when we talk about classic 80s heavy metal. Trouble always stood out as a weird outlier on Metal Blade's roster because they had such a sort of, you know, Sabbath influence. They had this heavier, doomier vibe to the music that you just didn't hear on very many other releases at the time. There were other doom bands operating in that time frame. Kellen mentioned Witchfinder General, but Witchfinder General was not a popular entity at all back in the day. They were a British band kind of, you know, mid to uh, period New Wave of British Heavy Metal. They were actually derided by a lot of metal fans at the time as being a little too goofy and a little too gimmicky. With the album covers having all the costumes and women running around, you know, with, you know, their tops falling off and such. Um, they weren't seen as a very serious heavy metal band at the time. I've even seen New Wave of British Heavy Metal critics who don't consider them very doomy. Uh, so there you go. There are bands like, you know, The Obsessed, uh, which are kind of in the trouble camp. They've got a traditional metal framework, but it does have a doomy vibe built on top. Kellen mentioned St. Vitus. You know, that's maybe more of a pure doom metal uh, project. You know, St. Vitus, though, always had, you know, weird associations as well. They always had, you know, some songs here and there that had a little bit of punk or hardcore influence, and they had an appeal to that crowd because they were on SST records and toured a lot with bands like Black Flag, which had to be a really weird bill to see back there in you know, the early and mid 80s to see, you know, hardcore bands playing you know, with these guys, you know, with long hair doing Sabbath riffs. So, yeah, and there were other Doomy bands active back then for sure. But I, again, in my mind, there's, you know, a genre distinction there between doom metal and, you know, traditional classic 80s heavy metal. Maybe that's just a construct in my mind, but you know, I wouldn't say if someone says, like, what does trouble sound like? I wouldn't immediately compare them to bands like, you know, Omen or Accept or Judas Priest. I'd much more likely compare them to bands like Black Sabbath or The Obsessed. So you kind of run into the same thing then Moving forward with Crypt Sermon, if someone asks me what Crypt Sermon sounds like, I'm much more likely to reference something like Solitude Eternus than I am at Riot City or Traveler or Visigoth or one of those bands, which is why I've kind of you know left Crypt Sermon out of the new wave of traditional heavy metal circles there. Now, just to be clear, too, it, at the end of the day, it's fine whether Kellen and I put them in different uh, places and put them other under different labels. It doesn't make a big difference. I'm not trying to defend my position is right. I'm certainly not trying to say Kellen's position is wrong. But in my mind, here again is where you know the genre and subgenre thing comes in useful. I want to be able to describe a band as having a particular sound as best I can when describing it to someone. If I tell somebody Crypt Sermon is new wave of traditional heavy metal, a lot of folks might immediately jump to the conclusion they're going to sound an awful lot like you know a, a Visigoth or a Traveler. And I think there's enough difference in their style that it would do a disservice to the person to describe Crypt Sermon that way. So again, do I describe them as a pure doom metal band? Uh, maybe. Maybe this is a point where you have to add another adjective to the genre. Maybe you have to say, oh, they're a doomy new wave of traditional heavy metal band. Uh, you can probably come up with something that's catchier sounding than that. Uh, but that at least would let folks know that, okay, they kind of fall in with these other bands, uh, like Riot City or Fortress, but there's something a little different about them. 
we've added the adjective doomy and that means that yeah okay i know what doom sounds like and i know what those traditional bands sound like so i'm starting to blend the two and then maybe they can approach that album with you know the mindset of i know what i'm getting into here i'm not going to hear just you know another traveler clone or something i want to hear something that yeah leans into that you know slower a little more atmospheric vibe to it how you work the epic uh qualifier into all of this <laughs> that's a question for another video you know kellen marty and jim talked about that some on one of the recent album club videos where they discussed one of the battle roar albums and yeah epic is not an easy quality to pin down at either when it comes to describing music or you know genres or subgenres or whatnot so yeah i think that pretty much covers you know some points that i just wanted to follow up with again really enjoyed kellen's video thought he added a lot to the conversation by bringing up those bands from the earlier 2000s that I'm just not qualified to discuss at this point. They're not part of my listening background, but they are part of the new wave of traditional heavy metal story for sure. And as such, they should have been brought up, and I'm glad he did. Um, but yeah, we may not agree completely on what to do with some of the bands that fall, you know, a little closer to the Doom camp, or you know, we may not quite see eye to eye on how impactful Doom was in sort of you know the earlier mid '80s heavy metal scene, but that's quite okay too. I've got no problem with his opinion. Uh, he always has things well thought out, well constructed, and I enjoyed watching his video quite a bit. And I hope you enjoyed watching this one as well. So now that I'm done, let's continue to talk metal in the comments down below. Our subgenre is just a complete and total pain in the ass, and they're just causing more confusion than anything else, you know? Or, as I contended earlier, do you think you know, they have some actual real service? They may be contentious at times, but I do think that they help people better understand what to expect. You know, in a perfect world, we would never try to describe music with words. We would just listen to the music and hear what it sounds like. But there's only so much time in the day that we do need a classification to try to help point us in the right direction. I think we need some signposts, but you know, maybe you disagree with that. Uh, that's quite okay. Leave a comment down below. Where would you put Crip Sermon on the spectrum of different genres? Are they strictly doom metal? Are they strictly new wave of traditional heavy metal? Uh, do they fit in the middle of some weird diagram between Manowar, Black Sabbath, and Savage Grace? Um, yeah, people are going to place them in slightly different points, and that's quite okay. But where would you put a band like Crypt Sermon? How would you describe them? If someone you're at the record store next time looking around, somebody you don't know holds up a Crypt Sermon CD and says, you know, hey, do you know anything about this band? What do they sound like? How would you describe them to that person so that they'd have a good idea of what to expect if they decide to spend some of their money on that CD or that piece of vinyl? Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think. All right, so that's going to have to wrap this one up. So until next time, everybody take care. And as always, keep banging your head and check out Kellen's videos too.